All right. So our next speaker, um, if you were on the farm field trip yesterday to McGrath Family Farms, uh, Phil McGrath mentioned Laura Avery, who runs the Santa Monica Farmers Market, and basically raved about her and basically pointed out that um, you hear a lot about farmers markets not having real farmers. Well, Santa Monica Farmers Market always has real farmers, and it's because of because of Laura, and she's a tireless advocate for farmers, and it's the reason why their their food is in all the restaurants in Santa Monica, why their their food is in all the the restaurants in our homes. The the farmers markets are are huge in Los Angeles and she's been manager of the uh Wednesday market and in, note that it's a Wednesday and she she managed, she graced us with her presence. Um <laughs> Uh, she's been doing it since 1982, and uh, when she started there was just one, and now there are three more farmer's markets. And there are approximately 20,000, they serve approximately 20,000 customers and 130 California farmers per week. And as a result of her efforts, more consumers are directly connecting with their food and their farmers. And the Wednesday uh, Santa Monica Farmer's Market has become basically the premier destination for chefs to meet and source farm fresh produce for over 100 area restaurants, and I'm hurrying. Uh, Laura also delivers a farmer's market report which airs weekly on KCRW's Good Food radio program. And without further ado, thank you. you. Thank you. And what about my time? I got 20 minutes, and is there a time cue thing somewhere? I will, yeah, I'll flag you. Wave with, at me? Okay. I'll wave at you. Great. Well, uh, yeah, I feel a little schizophrenic because it's a Wednesday and I'm not in Santa Monica. I can probably count in under 20 the days I haven't been there on a Wednesday. But um, I'm going to do a brief history of farmers markets, how they came to be. I think a lot of people just assume that farmers markets have always been there, sort of a right of every citizen and every community to have a farmers market. But actually, farmers markets in California didn't start until 1978 when uh, then Jerry Brown, Secretary of Agriculture, signed into administrative law the uh, Farmer to Consumer Direct Marketing Act, which for the first time allowed farmers to sell produce directly to customers at a location that was designated as a certified farmer's market. Prior to that, shipping and marketing channels very severely constrained the ways that farmers could have their produce packed and prepared the quality standards, which were basically the perfect cosmetic, usually always not ripe, because ripe could never withstand being shipped and tumbled down in a line and stored and, and, and stored again and refrigerated until it finally got to a supermarket. So the Farmer to Consumer Direct Marketing Act of 1978 was passed. There was The reason it didn't pass any sooner was there was quite a bit of organized opposition from the Retail Grocers Association Western Growers, Ag Council, all the big ag distri distribution entities that were involved in the multi-step profit taking of the cost of produce by the time it got to the consumer. Farmers were getting less and less of the farm dollar. This is true today, and that was touched on in the previous panel. Today, farmers only make eight cents on a dollar. For every dollar that's spent on produce, the farmer only gets eight cents back. But um, the Direct Marketing Act allowed farmers to sell produce directly to a customer at a certified farmer's market, exempt from certain standards. One of them was for ripeness and maturity. So they could actually sell ripe and mature fruits and vegetables to consumers at a farmer's market. And since it was a face-to-face -face transaction, there did not need to be the standard pack, you know, 18 heads of cauliflower per level in a box. They could just pick what they wanted out of a box and sell it and it was a, a direct contact between the actual farmer and producer. And this uh, got rid of the, 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 the middle charges, and farmers were able to get a retail price for their produce on the same day at a farmer's market. So um, um, the direct marketing also um, stipulated that the only people, the only entities that could operate a certified farmer's market were a farmer, a nonprofit entity, or a municipality. And that was, again, meant to not set up farmers markets as commercial enterprises per se, but simply to facilitate the uh, transaction of business between growers and consumers on a, on a, at a farmers market. 
Um, one of the first farmers markets to open in Los Angeles County was the Gardena Farmers Market. I think it was the first. It was organized by the Interfaith Hunger Coalition. Um, back when the, in the day, a lot of nonprofit um, hunger advocacy uh, organizations operated farmers markets. Santa Monica was the first municipality in, in LA County to open a farmers market, and that's because our mayor, Ruth Yanata Goldway, who was mayor in 1981, uh, was a former CETA worker. She was sort of an ex-hippie. She saw the farmer's markets as being a good thing. Um, and as mayor, she waived any sort of requirements for a business license or a street closure fee or paying for the parking meters that we were using on the street. So the market opened uh, on July 15th in 1981. There were 23 farmers who had been recruited by the California Department of Agriculture to come to the market, and it actually opened with a very auspicious uh, opening day sales. The 23 farmers grossed a total of $10,000. Some of the farmers made $1,000, and that was quite good money for one day, five hours of sales for a lot of these farmers. Um, I think I'm going to speak a little bit later about sponsoring organizations and how important they are to the success or failure of a farmer's market. Uh, the, the, uh, obviously, the city of Santa Monica has been very supportive of the Santa Monica farmers markets. 85% of Santa Monica residents shop at one of the four farmers markets. We are a community service of the city of Santa Monica. And um, uh, I think it, the support of the city has been very essential to our ongoing success. A uh, couple of interesting stories from some of our farmers. Jerry Rudas, a lot of you know who go to the Wednesday market. He was a a uh, young college graduate from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and he went to work for a conventional iceberg lettuce grower, growing lettuce just as he had been taught in school. And his mother convinced him to go to the Santa Monica Farmer's Market to sell his lettuce. Well, when he got to the Santa Monica Market, he could sell his lettuce for 50 cents a head as opposed to a profit of 50 cents a crate for his lettuce. So he soon realized that the way to go was to market direct, and he has since totally diversified his crop. So all of you who know Jerry Rudas know that he has one of the most delicious and most varied uh, crop uh, offerings at the, at the farmer's market, and he's become very successful. He also runs a fabulous uh, farm stand up on his farm, and he's an uh, all around great farmer. Unfortunately, his two daughters are not interested at all in keeping the farm. So anyone who wants to start farming, you should talk to Jerry, because I mean, he's got a very nice farm. It may be available. Um, um, however, in the early days of farmers markets, there were other people who equally took advantage of fairly lax regulations, and anybody who uh, could get their hands on, a, on a, a Xeroxed copy of somebody's certified producer certificate could use that and go downtown to the wholesale market and buy produce and then come in and just show the manager. Back in the early days, if they had a certified producer certificate, you had to let them into the market. So there were Xeroxes of Xeroxes of Xeroxes of these things going around. There'd be two growers at the same market and go, wait a minute, what are you doing here? I'm supposed, who are you? So um, I and a bunch of other uh, concerned managers spent many trips to Sacramento trying to tighten up the regulations. So now all farmers have to have an original embossed certificate, uh, farmer's market certificate. And they're, they're uh, given out in, in limited number to these farmers. Um, farmers were forming multiple partnerships. Well, I'm out of stuff, but now I'm his partner, so I'm going to bring his stuff in, and now he's out, now I'm going to bring his stuff in. So we tightened up a lot of the regulations regarding how farmers' markets were operated and what farmers' certified producers had to show as proof of um, producership in order to be uh, allowed into the market. So... Um, as the farmer's markets proliferated in popularity, and the Santa Monica farmer's market did grow rapidly over its first 10 years, it, it basically doubled every year. Uh, so we were, we were very happy to be very successful and absolutely serving the community that was uh, obviously ready for this kind of thing. So that kind of gets us to where we are today. Now, you know, farmer's markets were supposed to be direct to consumer. There was to be no middleman, no resale, no buy and sell anywhere at a farmer's market. 
But um, farmers markets continued to grow in popularity. I don't know if any of you, you probably do remember in 1989 when the ALAR, the uh, carcinogenic growth regulator that was found on Washington State apples made the front page of Newsweek magazine. And that was the same year that the Chilean grapes were found that had been injected with poison. So consumers became very concerned about the safety of their food. More and more of them started coming to farmers markets. The 19 80s and 90s were probably the largest two decades for the growth of certified farmers markets in LA County. All the major farmers markets, Santa Monica, Beverly Hills, Torrance, Hollywood, Mar uh, not Mar Vista, La Cienega, um, Culver City, Westwood, a lot of these markets just took off in the uh, 80s and 90s and um, got uh, extremely popular. More and more people shopping, more and more talk about them. They were, they were uh, really quite the place to be. Um, so it wasn't long until uh, the chefs started coming around, and um, I remember seeing Nancy Silverton, who was then with Campanile, coming to the market on Wednesday and spending hours with wads of money and buying lots and lots of produce and taking it back to Campanile. So other chefs started coming, and by 1999, we sort of had to have our first Chef Appreciation Day when a lot of farmers said, you got you to do something to these chefs. These chefs are great. They're buying a lot of stuff. So we, we had a sort of a coffee reception for the chefs, and uh, we've been very appreciative ever since, and they have contributed quite significantly to the ongoing growth of the farmer's market sales. 1999 was also the year that the, uh, the direct marketing program was defunded by the state of California. I believe it was Pete Wilson. Uh, just took the general fund money away, and farmers markets were forced to fund themselves through a per farmer, per market assessment fee. Um, so we went to Sacramento, we found uh, a person to carry the legislation, we suggested a fee of 60 cents per farmer, per market, which just sounds absolutely minuscule, but we were not all, nobody wanted to raise any kind of fees for farmers. Legislators did not want to touch any legislation that was going to charge farmers a fee. So that went into effect, and so the funding for the direct marketing program got very, very small, and um, enforcement sort of fell by the wayside. So we had very little oversight from the state as far as ensuring, as, as the former panel was talking about, are these people really growing this? How are they getting this? And is this coming from their farm? So we've been concerned about um, uh, integrity and enforcement um, as the program has grown and grown and grown, and the funds remain very, very limited. So that's another challenge I'll be talking about soon. Um, so here we are today. Um, inevitably, after Nancy Silverton came more chefs and then more restaurants and then the Food Channel and everybody started talking about the chefs at the farmer's market. Uh, shortly after that, the produce companies started coming because some of the chefs just didn't have time to spend all day shopping. So. Uh, you would find a produce company coming to the market, walk around the market with the chef. The chef would then go to the restaurant. The produce company would pick the stuff up and deliver it. Um, and so that became um, an even bigger part of, of the farmer sales. Now, these are all direct sales from a farmer to, uh, to, a, to a, a, a middleman, a broker, that would then be taken directly to a restaurant. It was more of a, a delivery sort of a system. I guess you could say it was a nascent food hub because they were sort of aggregating one produce company would get enough produce for a restaurant for maybe a dozen farmers or three or four farmers and take it. Well, uh, our dear friend Russ Parsons wrote an article in the LA Times one day because he was at a market and he saw a chef and a produce company arguing about who was going to get the last of Phil McGrath's pea tendrils off the table. And um, Ag found out that we were selling to produce companies, which was a direct contradiction of direct marketing regulations. So I was called in for a meeting with Los Angeles County Agriculture and with the, uh, one of the, dep one of the um, people from Sacramento and asked to explain myself and why this had been happening at the farmer's market. Um, and I explained that it had been going on for about 15 years. We've been doing this for a long time and their inspectors were there. Every they didn't, they never noticed. So what happened is instead of stopping the sales to produce companies because it had become so popular and the farmers were making very, very good money from selling to produce companies as well as customers. Um, 
Luckily, some uh, legislation, AB 2168, was in the works, and so we stuck on some language, not we, somebody else stuck on language, that allowed the sale of produce at a certified farmer's market to a produce company, to a wholesale buyer, as long as the produce was traceable by means of a memorandum, which is a receipt, from the produce company back to the farmer, so from the restaurant back to the produce. So if somebody at Spago got sick eating um, bok choy, they would know exactly what farm that came from. So that sort of took care of all the, um, all the uh, concerns about traceability and, and um, it still was in spirit direct marketing. I just, these are just eye candy. This is just what I get to look at every week. <laughs> Little palate cleanser there. So farmers markets, you know, they, they have uh, obviously all the attributes of um, quality, freshness, uh, more, more money for farmers. Um, uh, a sense of community, and then, and then two, this whole concept of supporting a greater good and doing more for more people than just going and having a transaction somewhere. Um, you know you're supporting uh, the farmer who uh, treats their farmers well, uh, their, their employees well, takes care of the land, you know, is, has good stewardship for their animals. Um, and so, I think these are all things that we all obviously know very well. I'm kind of preaching to the choir on that one. But um, this is, the, this is a Bill Coleman's stand. This is at the Wednesday market. And, and there's basically these two economies. There's the economy behind the table. These are the chefs in the morning picking up their pre-orders and chit-chatting and socializing. There's Romeo and his kids. This happens every week. We have over 100 chefs now who come to the farmer's market. I know because I give them their parking passes. So um, they've been quite significant, as have the produce companies. Uh, they have a chance to not just pick up, but to talk and catch up on their news. And at the same time, the front of the table is completely stocked. The farmers, by and large, will not sell produce. They won't sell out of what they have. They'll always save it for the table customers. So we got both sides of the table. It's kind of a two sides of the table economy going on here. And it's worked really well. Um, some of the farmers do get asked to sell more than they can grow, at which case then the trucks have to deal with either going to the farm themselves or, um, not, or not getting everything they need. So one of the other very interesting, um, I want to talk a little bit about passion and about the people that are committed to participating in um, helping farmers sell their produce. And one of them is we had a volunteer named Shida who worked with us and she really wanted to have a produce stand that would be totally sourced from the farmer's market. So she wound up with a friend starting this pop-up. And the pop-ups, of course, are very popular. Roy Choi and his Koji barbecue truck kind of kicked off that whole thing. And so they started a produce pop-up at a coffee shop, Handsome Coffee Roasters, in downtown LA. And they come every Wednesday, and they go around the market. They go to the farm, and then they go to the market, and then they personally sort of curate produce. They make market baskets that are pre-ordered, but then they also make beautiful produce displays inside Handsome Coffee Roasters. And so people could, I don't hope that's not out of focus. People can come down and uh, pick up their baskets and buy produce and hear the stories of the farmers. This is in downtown LA and this is people who would never get out to the Wednesday farmer's market. So this is a great way for Shida and Sarah, her partner, to actually get their passion going here as far as working with something with the farmer's market and also providing um, great produce to people kind of in the inner city, there aren't a lot of really good, big, full-service farmers markets yet in downtown LA. So, um, you know, and it's a, um, it's sort of a um, economy of scale. It's, it's like you don't just say, I'm going to open a farmers market, close the parking lot, put a bunch of farmers in and expect people to come. It, it just, it's more, you kind of have to know who your buyers are. And then you have to kind of figure out what they'll buy and how much they're going to buy. And then you kind of work with the farmer uh, and, and get what they want and then uh, tell the farmer's story. And the thing that makes the produce project so great and so successful, they now actually have two locations, is the stories they tell about the farmers and the care with which they curate all the wonderful produce they get that they sell. Another little eye, eye refresher here. Um, I love it. Um, this. 
I'm going to talk about the future of farmers markets also and the farmers market of the future. This is a fascinating project. This is um, in Santa Monica Place on the third floor. Their dream was to start a Ferry Plaza style, uh, you know, produce hall. Well, they never had any produce because the idea, they even asked Phil McGrath to do this. Come to, the, come to the mall seven days a week and sell your produce up here in a market. Well, nobody, no farmer can do that. Uh, so there's a uh, very entrepreneurial person named Giles who started this project called the Santa Monica Merchant. And he talked Santa Monica Place into giving him a very large space. So when that wall comes down, it's going to be later this month, he will have a full produce display. And it's a place where people can come buy pre-order or buy custom produce baskets that are sourced directly from the farmer's market twice a week. So this is the next best thing to having a farmer's market, um, convenient, uh, custom designed just for you uh, in a convenient location. We're very excited that this is happening and uh, really hoping the model will, will take off and serve a lot of people. He has one called the Venice Merchant in Venice and he's actually expanding now into Santa Monica. We are going to also try to get um, Santa Monica City employees and other uh, businesses in Santa Monica as part of our sustainable food initiative in Santa Monica to uh, participate in the market basket delivery option to their place of work. So that's another model of um, something that is possibly a good uh, look down the road for farmers um, who, who want to expand their, their sales while they're in Santa Monica. This is, you know, meanwhile, the life at the farmer's market goes on. And um, this is Scott Peacock. He's got these great eggplants and uh, uh, persimmons. And he's a one-person family farm. Uh, this is at the Wednesday market. And then again, this is the back of his table. And this is where his two-sided business is going on. But he's, uh, um, we're, the markets are going strong. Uh, customers are loving it. And they're still coming. And we are getting... Um, uh, bigger and bigger, and we actually just came off our best year ever. Uh, we are, I suppose, recession-proof. I think people are coming out to do this kind of thing because it's, it makes them feel good, it makes them happy, it's edifying, and it's a really good use of their money. One of the other ways that we're able to assist farmers and participate in the burgeoning uh, good food movement and the community service that, uh, that's going on all over the place with food deserts, we now have this wonderful nonprofit called Food Forward, and they do what's called market recovery. They come to the farmer's market every Wednesday. Uh, they got a grant, and they come to the farmer's market, and they pick up leftover produce at the end of the day from farmers and they are very organized. They have aprons and the beauty of their program is is they give the farmer an empty box. Farmers don't like to part with their boxes. So they have these nice boxes. They walk around the market an hour before it closes, ask the farmer if they have anything, give them a box. At the end of the market, the farmer puts the stuff in the box, farmer leaves, and then these volunteers pick up the food and take it down to uh, various food service agencies. And I got their highlights here from 2012. They were only open for, they started in August, and by the end of 2012, at the Santa Monica Farmer's Market, they had um, collected 23,000 pounds of produce, they had 56 farmers donating, and they were serving six uh, social service agencies, Step Up on Second, St. Joseph, Claire Foundation, Union Rescue Mission, Mission, Meals on Wheels, and the Downtown Women's Center, and they also had 12 wonderful volunteers uh, participating, and uh, always sunny, always smiling, just all of them should have exclamation marks after their names on their and their badges because they're so enthusiastic. So the farmers don't like to take things home. They also get a tax receipt, uh, not that it's you know the main purpose of what they do, but farmers are happy to help, and um, they don't want to drive all that produce home. So it's worked out really well. They've now expanded to three or more farmers markets, and their program is growing, and it's doing more service every week to more locations. So challenges to farmers' markets, uh, there are a lot. Now, this is supposed to be sliding in graphics here. Oh. All right. Public space where a farmer's market is located becomes more desirable. The Westwood Village Farmer's Market on Weyburn was a bustling market until development came along, and the market was there one day, and it was gone the next. It was very sad. It was a very, very good market. Um, 
Hollywood Farmers Market uh, has been uh, subject to a, sort of a project, you know, land grab back from the um, art school where they are located, and uh, they're having to look at possibly relocate part of the market to accommodate a driveway to go into a parking lot that's barely used on Sundays. Markets can outgrow their space. There's a wonderful story about the Altadena Farmer's Market that started out as a guerrilla urban market up in Altadena. It was uh, no, cert no, no certificates, no, no health permits, no nothing. It was a bunch of people who got together to barter food originally. Uh, they'd meet in the backyard of a private home up in Altadena, the Zane Gray House. Um, Steve Rudisell and his wife grew dairy goats. People would come and barter. And, uh, and then Jonathan Gold wrote about it, and then a 1,000 people showed up, and then they closed the market. <laughs> the neighbors just weren't having it. But now the good news is the Altadena market has now reopened in Altadena as a certified farmer's market with all the blessings of all the uh, appropriate agencies, and they are featuring backyard growers, and uh, their manager, Joseph Schuldiner, who founded the Institute of De uh, uh, Domestic Technology, is now in charge of that market. And uh, his spirit is very much there, and it's, it's a wonderful place. Um, regulations that cause challenges, and um, Lucy Norris touched on this in our last um, panel, the last panel. And the, um, the Food Safety Modernization Act is a very scary, very large bill that's coming down the pike, and it's going to address all these horrible um, disease outbreaks that have been associated with corporate agriculture, with the uh, green onions and the jalapenos and the strawberries and all these corporate products that were that are you know unsustainably farmed in, in you know near runoff from feedlots. So food safety comes down with a very heavy hammer. This is all the FDA. And there are going to be some very, very restrictive um, requirements that are going to be put on farmers unless uh, we are right now trying to contact legislators to, to kind of pull these back. They're going to talk about how um, animal habitat around growing grounds has to be completely cut down because you can't have a bat flying over your field or an owl, which are natural, you know, predator, uh, natural pest uh, reducers. Um, streams, if a frog might hop out of a stream, you can't have a stream near your field. Uh, beneficial insect rows where, oh my God, there's bugs you know, around the field. So these are very scary. This whole FSMA, Food Safety Modernization Act, is a very bad thing for small farmers. So we are motivating the farmers. We're emailing them and having them send. And there's a comment period that ends on um, November 15th. If you go to CAF, C-A-F-F dot org, you can also comment on it, but our farmers are going to be making a lot of comments. Um, as I mentioned earlier, funding for the farmers markets is very low, and we try to get legislation to increase the funding to increase uh, enforcement. Unfortunately, our bill died uh, in one of the many committees it had to go through. So we're still trying to get more enforcement on a state cross-county basis to go after farmers who are coming into the market and selling products that they don't grow. That's one of our main concerns in Santa Monica, and that's something we're always trying to be aware of. It would be great if the state could do a little more, and they, we are working closely with them to um, get, get better enforcement. Um, Los Angeles City, a couple years ago, wanted to charge all of its farmers markets that are on streets a street closure fee, like the same fee they charge if there's a parade. It was going to be $500 a week per farmer market. It was absolutely unaffordable. Fortunately, we worked with the Commissioner of Public Works and helped get rid of that. Um, but, but there are constant challenges, regulatory, um, safety, uh, other things that make farmers markets very, very uh, subject to takeover or, or adulteration one way or another. There's that awful FSMA. Yeah, that's the one you got to. Um, yeah, so all these things can affect farmers markets. Um, I put this quote up here only because it's sort of indicative of the more it changes, the more it's the same. And I think farmers like, uh, customers like to go to farmers markets because they, uh, they, they're given the opportunity of choice. They know it's not GMO grown. They know the animals are humanely raised. The animals are um, you know, certified humane. One of our beef growers actually has a mobile slaughter unit on the property. And I read this actually in the Sunday LA Times. It was talking about why happiness is so important and what government can do to make people happy. And I think about the governance of the city of Santa Monica, but also this talking about 70% of American industry is concentrated in the hands of 600 corporations. That was in 1932. 
So that really hasn't changed. And I think what's so exciting about the this movement, the food movement, that we are all uh, experiencing today, whether in the form of shopping at a farmer's market or working with a nonprofit or legislating or working on policy issues for people that can make a difference for, for more people, um, is that we really now want things to change. And the level at which we are sort of stuck in this corporate fog of everything and we have no choice, I think we're finally really starting to wake up about this. And um, I think that, uh, I think things are going to be changing. I don't know how many of you were involved in sending in comments around the farm bill, uh, not the least of which was they are trying to get rid of food stamps for, you know, needy people. But, you know, it's business as usual with big ags. Farmers markets are still a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of that. They say that only 1% of the population even shops at a non-conventional outlet, but we're the 1%, we're here, we're, we're making it real, and um, I think that, uh, I think there could be some changes coming soon, that's what we're hoping. Another big challenge for farmers markets is the, the predominance now of farmers markets that are not really farmers markets, they're more swap meets or food festivals or lunch courts. And um, I think a majority of farmers markets are now at least 50% non-farmers. Um, some are way more than 50% non-farmers. And sponsors, uh, certain sponsors are renting out space to basically anyone who wants to rent a space on a farmers market. So um, I think one of the big challenges is having committed, dedicated managers who, who are really there, as all these previous panelists said, to do what's right for the farmer. My definition of success for a farmer's market is if it's good for the farmer, if the farmer's doing well, it's a good market and everybody is going to benefit. So um, we are uh, fighting that fight all along. Um, and, you know, the farmer's market of the future, uh, I think it'll be a farmer's market to scale. It could be a small farmer's market like a church parking lot in Gardena. Uh, they were talking about the health initiative in Washington where the hospitals are trying to get locally sourced produce. Kaiser Permanente has a Thrive campaign and they've opened farmers markets on a lot of their campuses. My friend and colleague Ann Epstein runs two farmers market at Kaiser's. One has 14 farmers and one has 18 farmers. All the farmers are doing really well. They come once a week. And the hospital staff and the doctors, they're leading by example. They're buying food at the, at the farmer's market. We're trying to get that food into the cafeteria. That's a much bigger challenge. But um, we are um, working along those lines. Um, I think um, I get called all the time. Somebody wants to open a farmer's market in their uh, office complex or the... Um, the local business district wants to put a farmer's market on a Saturday. By the time I'm done asking what they mean by a farmer's market, it turns out they didn't mean a farmer's market at all. They were talking about a carnival or a food court. And uh, so I'm thinking that farmer's markets are, uh, if you go and you see a lot of happy farmers and the farmers there, you know, you're going to know that they're here. They're here to stay and they're benefiting the farmers and there by all of us. So thanks so much and I'll see you at one of the Santa Monica markets soon. Well, that Santa Monica merchant, did I get, I didn't get to all my slides. Ta-da. So, yeah. Communication, putting the market behind farmers. And then to quote my dear friend Joseph Schuldheimer, you got to have heart. You got to love what you're doing. You got to be all about the farmers. Everything will be okay. Uh, I think the model that, that was being shown there by the Santa Monica merchant, uh, they talk about why can't we have produce on the weekend? And it says market and there's no produce. They talked to a lot of farmers, and they said, do you want to come here and stand around here seven days a week and sell your produce? And they were like, not so much. Plus, it's not fresh. Santa Monica Merchant's going to be bringing produce down, tw getting produce twice a week from farm produce that's brought in fresh to the Wednesday and Saturday farmer's markets in Santa Monica. I think that's the first step. They're going to be open late hours. You can order at any time. The market baskets are completely um, customized. You, they have the grass-fed beef. They've got the free-range chicken. They've got the eggs. They have everything you can get at a farmer's market. All you got to do is go online and order it. And I think 
that's going to be the best way to have that happen now. We talked a lot about uh, having a, you know, a midnight flower market somewhere. That would be fun. But, you know, that's, that's, that's coming later, I guess. But, yeah, it's a great idea. So are there any questions? Or? Okay. Well, thank you all. And um, go on CAF and look for uh, FISMA, send in your comments. I also just want to kind of just plug my... We do a library panel quarterly in Santa Monica, and the, our last one of the year is November 21st. It's called What is a Recipe? We're going to be waxing eloquent about recipes. They're, you know, what they are is memory or, uh, or nostalgia for the holidays. So we've got Kevin West, who's a well-known uh, food, master food preserver. We have Ann Willen, who just wrote a memoir about her cooking school in France. Lauren Chun, who wrote the kimchi cookbook. It's a whole book all about kimchi. Uh, Valerie Gordon, a wonderful bakery and pastry maker who sells at the Saturday market, and Russ Parsons, who will be there, and they're all going to be discussing what is a recipe. I have some little cards here I can give you. It's uh, when, uh, Thursday, November 21st. It's free. It's at the Santa Monica Main Library. It's part of our ongoing discussion series, and love it if you could all stop on by and check it out. It's going to be really fun. By the way, everybody's all raffling off a copy of their book there, too. So... So you can come and get one of these if you want. It's just a little reminder card for our library panel. Great. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.